When thinking about first-line treatment for polycythemia vera, there are a variety of different options that we have now, and it's important to really focus on what's right for the patient. So patients that are low-risk patients that don't have any symptoms from their disease and don't have leukocytosis and thrombocytosis, so their platelets and their white blood cell counts aren't too elevated, are decent candidates initially for consideration of aspirin and phlebotomy. Phlebotomy, although the field is moving away from it, still plays a role at the beginning of a diagnosis. Um, as sometimes patients can have really high red blood cell counts and phlebotomy is a quick way to get that level to come down. And oftentimes patients feel much better immediately once you start doing phlebotomy. The problem with phlebotomy is long-term, it can be challenging, it can cause iron deficiency and fatigue, patients can get scarring of their veins, and so then um, they may not tolerate that indefinitely. And in addition, if patients have a high white blood cell count at diagnosis or they develop a high platelet count um, over the course of their treatment with phlebotomy, which happens as patients develop iron deficiency anemia, phlebotomy may just lose its efficacy for those patients. We also know that patients that have a lot of phlebotomy just don't generally have their blood counts well controlled. And so although they may tolerate it, it's just not the most effective treatment and it may not be that practical. For first line treatment, the most common medication that is given is hydroxyurea. As this is a medication that is a pill, it's cheap, it's been around for a long time and doctors usually feel very comfortable giving this medicine. For many patients, this medicine is great. It's well tolerated. It doesn't really have a lot of side effects. However, for some patients, it can be difficult as it may not control the symptoms of their disease. And sometimes it's difficult to control the blood counts adequately. It's not uncommon for patients to do the hydroxyurea dance where one visit they increase the dose and then the next visit they decrease the dose because um, it's difficult to find a dose that doesn't either decrease the blood counts too much um, or, or cause side effects as the dose gets increased more. And so for some patients, like I mentioned, it's a good treatment. One pill a day or a few pills a day leads to blood count control, um, but it does have its limitations. And it's important as a patient or provider to recognize that if you've been going back and forth on a hydroxyurea uh, dose to try to switch to something different. Officially, the definition of hydroxyurea resistance is if a patient needs to take greater than two grams of hydroxyurea a day or four pills of hydroxyurea a day, um, without adequate control of blood counts. But really, um, the development of low blood counts or not controlling symptoms is also a reason to think about hydroxyurea um, as not, not being efficacious and switching to something else. We have interferon as well for patients with polycythemia vera. Robig interferon is approved for treatment in patients with low-risk polycythemia vera. So those are patients that are less than 60 and have not had a blood clot. And for those patients, robig interferon was studied at 100 micrograms, so at a low dose, and it controls blood counts better than uh, phlebotomy. So that's definitely an option for our low-risk patients. The nice thing with robig interferon that we know as well is that over time, it can lower the level of the JAK2 mutation, something that cannot happen with phlebotomy alone and does not happen with hydroxyurea either. And because of this, there's a lot of interest in our young patients to be treated with interferon. Robig interferon is also approved for, for high-risk patients. And for those patients, we do have the option of also going um, up on the dose over time to control the blood counts better. Although the verdict is still out on whether or not a lower dose or a higher dose really makes a difference in long-term outcomes. Robig interferon is a subcutaneous injection. It's given twice a month. And once patients achieve a um, blood count control, it can be given once a month. So it really becomes easy to take. And like I mentioned previously for low-risk patients, robig interferon, as well as other interferons can lower the level of the JAK2 mutation. And so that has led to a lot of excitement to using this medication. And then lastly, we have uh, ruxolitinib or Jacophy that's approved in the second line setting for patients that have not done well with one treatment. Um, and so ruxolitinib is an easy medicine. It's a pill that's taken twice a day. It's excellent for controlling symptoms, in particular itching. And we've learned recently from a clinical trial called the MAGIC PV study that ruxolitinib is better than hydroxyurea at controlling symptoms, controlling blood counts, and also preventing blood clots. So really we have some nice options for our patients to not only control their blood counts, but also improve their symptoms and potentially 
with roping interferon and with ruxolitinib to also alter the course of this disease by lowering that JAK2 mutation. So the optimal time or times at which genetic testing should be done for polycythemia vera patients is still a concept that's evolving. There are some times where it's obvious and standard, and then there are some other times when we still don't know the benefits of that. So when a patient is first diagnosed or suspected of having a diagnosis of polycythemia vera, genetic testing is a must. The test that must be done is a JAK2V617F mutational test. And if the patient does not have that mutation, which occurs in over 97% of patients, then they can be tested for another mutation called uh, JAG2, but found in another part of the gene called exon 12. If patients don't have either of those two mutations, which only occurs in a tiny percentage of patients, then they can be considered for what's called extended genetic testing or additional genetic testing that occasionally does find other genetic mutations. So diagnosis, that's an important time to do genetic testing. Then if you think that a patient is progressing, that means their disease is progressing to myelofibrosis or progressing to acute leukemia, that is a good time to do a bone marrow biopsy, as well as to do additional genetic testing um, to see if we can understand what's happening with the disease, are there new mutations that may explain the changes in blood counts um, and explain the progression. And so those are two pretty standard times to do genetic testing. Now, I also get the question of, I've been on interferon now for a few years, or I've been on ruxolitinib for a few years. I want to see what's happening with my mutations. You're not alone. Everybody wants to know. The problem is we don't necessarily know what to do with those results. What we know from the interferon studies, both ropig interferon as well as pegylated interferons like Pegasus, is that it takes a while. So if you haven't been on an interferon for at least two years, doing genetic testing is unlikely to be very beneficial. And after that, we really just don't know what to do with those results. So a question that I get with pa from patients is, um, can I ever stop my interferon? So there's some studies that show that patients with really deep remissions, the JAK2 mutation is not uh, found in the blood anymore, potentially they could stop their treatment. Um, but that's really not standard of care and not something that we have guidelines to, to really help determine how to treat patients. And so although I understand the curiosity of wanting to know what's happening to that JAK2 mutation, it's important to know two things. One, it's not standard of practice. And two, insurances may not like that. And so oftentimes patients are left with a bill. And so that really is an important thing to keep in mind. And then lastly, you know, oftentimes, especially when patients are, are um, diagnosed at a center that does lots of genetic testing at once, you know, they come in a panel, um, in addition to finding out the JAK2 mutation, we sometimes find other mutations. And as of 2024, we don't necessarily know what to do with that additional information. We know from myelofibrosis that there's some mutations that likely portend a worse prognosis. But at the moment, we really don't know how to advise our patients as to their prognosis um, or alter their treatment because of those mutations. And so again, although I definitely do a lot of genetic testing and I think it's important for the field to do genetic testing so that we can learn about our patients and then ultimately better uh, guide them. Currently, we just don't really know how to use those mutations to help patients and to ameliorate some of the anxiety that comes with that additional knowledge. Mm -hmm.